Well, well, the part that I didn't understand was the jinn comes to the physical plane. The closer he comes to the physical plane, it says the more evil he generates. What does that mean in relation to the time we're in now? I was speaking last night and I explained to them the devil has total control. It's a frightening situation. He has the world under control presently. It's not about Satan himself being here. He's taking leave. He's out of reach. He has to be baited again and brought back. You cannot totally eliminate him, ever. You follow that? Only Allah can do that. We can't. We can, we can bind him like Solomon did. And like Allah did through Job. But he is now out of reach because we here have given him the glory. You have given Satan his glory by worshiping his image, his likeness, and everything you do. You want to look like white people, you want to act like them. You've given him his glory, and he's in power. The master himself, as they call him, of Zazil, the wicked devil, cursing him, has no need to reside here. He's gone because you're doing a good enough job. The only way to get him is, if y'all would read Job chapter 1, you'll see how we have got to get the devil. Let's go on and see. Do you have the time to hear it? Yes. Yeah. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. You're going to watch a plot, a plan by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because during the period of Job, the devil was rampant in the earth the way he is today. And this is why the Almighty set up the plot of Job. Nobody on this plane knows who wrote the book of Job. None of your scholars have been able to find out who wrote the book of Job. All right? Now, it's thought, we call him Ayub in Arabic. Well, let me read on. This Job person and this story was a whole plot to trap the devil. And let me show you how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared the Almighty and obscured the devil. You understand about the man's nature now? This man Job was a righteous man and he feared the creator of the heavens and the earth and the devil couldn't touch him. The devil wouldn't, couldn't get him. Okay? Obscure the devil, that's what it means. He avoids the devil. Number two. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. You see the perfect number seven? His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke and oxen and 500 shias and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all men in the East. You see what they're saying about him? He was wealthy. He was a happy father. And he was a righteous man who feared the Almighty and the devil could not get next to him. This is a bait for the devil being set. You understand? How many people in that room can claim that prosperity? Total comfort and convenience, your family's healthy, your kids are there, you have all the wealth you need, and you fear the Almighty, worshiping Him day and night. And the devil never tempts you, can't get to you. You see? Number four. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Festivity. And it was so. When the days of their feasting were going about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered a burnt offering according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed the Almighty in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Not only did he, did he, was he write this and pray for himself, but according to the Judaic tradition, a sacrifice against sin, 
He made sure that in case anybody in his house did wrong, he was up every day to worship the Lord in a sacrifice for his children. To keep that house pure, unadulterated in any way. You understand? Let's go on. Now there was a day, and here's the plot being set. Now there was a day when the sons of the Creator, meaning the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also amongst them. Notice he only came amongst them this time. He's not testifying nothing or proclaiming nothing. Now, how do you know these sons of God are angels? Because Lucifer was an angel before he fell from grace, right? So he is in the midst of them comfortably as an angel when he was called before the throne of the Most High. Keep up with the plot now. Number seven. It is the most important number. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Where did you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. The devil was boasting about what he was doing in the world. He told the Almighty, I just came from walking to and fro on the earth and up and down doing my thing, <laughs> he said. That's the devil at work, talking about what he's doing. Now what does the, the Almighty say? And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant, Job? See how he's setting for the plot? You don't catch the plot yet, but watch. The devil just told the Almighty, Heavenly Father, that he was walking up down the earth doing his devilishment, and the Almighty pointed his finger at a righteous man and said, Go get him. <laughs> Have thou considered my servant Job? That is how he sets the plot. That there is none like him in the earth. So, what did he tell the devil? All the other people you have are not worth Job. You want him, because he's righteous. That's who you really want. These other people, they're disco popping and hanging out in the streets. You don't need them. They don't count. You already got them worshiping you. You need those people in that tabernacle over there. That's the ones you want to tempt. Forget those people in the street. They'll follow you. They worship you. They believe in you. This is the Lord is telling them. That there is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man. One that fears God and eschews the devil. <laughs> you, see this? you see it again? He repeated it again. That that is the guy that you want. Because he eschews you. He avoids you. You can't get him. Watch what happens in 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Doesn't he have a reason why he fears you? Because the devil tends to believe that everything is done through bargain and exchange. That's how he works, through bargain and exchange. And this is what people do to each other. They don't want to do nothing for you for nothing. That's why I said y'all got to live more by, by giving, stop living by take. Everybody does something. The first thing you say if someone helps you, there must be a reason why he's doing this. He wouldn't be helping me for nothing. Ain't that how people think? That's the devil's thinking. The devil turned to the Almighty and said, in number nine, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Doesn't he have a reason why he fears you, God? Ten. Has not thou made and hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side. Don't you got a covenant, something protecting him? Isn't he in your shield? Thou hast blessed the works of his hand. That means you made him very rich because he worked for it. He didn't just come by it. <laughs> Work by the sweat of your brow. He worked for it with his hands. And his substance is increased in the land. Because he went out and worked, the substance is increased. He has a lot. 
You protect him, that's why he fears you. You gave him a lot of wealth. You made him live comfortable. You gave him all the things he had. But watch. 11. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now the devil is baited. He just bit the hook. Because <laughs> he put the Almighty to question. You see? <laughs> the Almighty put forth a perfect man to take the devil's attention off the rest of the world. You understand that? <laughs> and now the devil just bit the hook. <laughs> he said, well, if you take away your guidance, He'll turn against you. Ain't that the question? Isn't that us again? As long as the light shines on you, the Quran says, you walk in it. But as soon as it gets dark, you thrust your fingers in your hair out of fear and you turn away from Allah. Put your, you put your trust in other things. As long as things look good, I mean, you're smiling. As soon as things don't go your way, you curse the heavens, you damn God and turn your way. When people are laying on hospital beds, they become the most religious people in the world. Oh God, just get me well. I'll be righteous. I'll do this. I'll do that. As soon as they're on their two feet and standing again, they forget all the promises, all the covenants. When their baby is ill and they, lay, they stand over that baby crying and caressing it, so God, please make my baby healthy again. I promise I'll do good. I'll do righteous. And when the baby's well again, they're slapping the baby upside the head and forgot all about the covenant. So the devil had just bit the bait. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath. See that? The devil said, take away all the stuff he got, not him. Take it all away from him. And what will happen? And he will curse thee to thy face. Now that's the bait. The devil just bit the hook. And 12, the Lord says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. <laughs> you see that? Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. You see that? Now the Lord got the devil's full attention on one righteous man and gives the world a chance to evolve into righteousness again. The, import the importance of Job Everybody always asks, what is the story and the importance of Job? Remember that question? Well, here's the answer. Job's story was a bait to trap the devil the way Solomon trapped him with his seal. Now, does the devil get trapped? Yes or no, is the question. Don't get too happy. We go on. So Satan, now watch this. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. He left the heavens and came back to earth again. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain thy servants with the edge of a sword, and only I escape to tell thee. <laughs> Who is this talking? This is the devil talking. <laughs> he caught Job and said, Job, because the, the Almighty gave him power to touch Job's stuff. Right? Said, Job, uh, the Sabians, now knows who they are, came down and killed the servants and took your flock. And I escaped to let you know about it. He stopped to look at Job's face to see if Job would curse the Almighty like you would do when you get mad. Did he? Let's see what happened. <laughs> I, he said, alone, escaped to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. Now he's going to blame it on God. <laughs> and has burnt up the sheep and thy servants and consumed them. And I only 
am escaped alone to tell thee. The devil has come again. Another devil right in front of him. One of his helpers. To say, now God did it. The two reasons have changed, first of all. You see what's happening right here? Let's go again. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and have slain the servants with the edge of a sword, and I only am escaped to tell thee. <laughs> you see it happening? The devils are coming from all sides trying to shake Job. Again, 19. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. <laughs> See, I keep repeating it though. <laughs> then Job arose. Now the devil's happy. He's waiting to see a response to see what Job is going to do here. Then Job arose and went, took me, took, rent his mantle. He put his robe on and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Job went and made gussel, you see, and went and made raka to Allah. Fell on his face and he prayed. The devil now is totally baffled because Job did not respond the way he was supposed to, the way you would have. You would have ran to see about your flock and ran to check on your kids and ran in every different direction, yelling and screaming, oh God, what happened? What did I do? And weeping and wailing and lamenting and moaning and complaining. But did Job do that? No, because Job, like the, like the beginning of the chapter said, was what? A perfect man. He was set there to set a trap for the devil. Let's go on and see what happened. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Nor did he accuse God for it. Now watch that. The next chapter begins too. Again. Now the devil just got hooked. You see that right? Now here's what happens the next time. And again there was a day. When the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Sons of God are who? Who are they y'all? And now see what happened. And Satan came amongst them doing what? Presenting himself before the Lord. He didn't do that the last time, you know. <laughs> he just was amongst them before. This time he came forth presenting himself. Came forth with a proclamation of something he wanted to say or do. You see that? And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? <laughs> that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man and upright, skews the devil, fears God. And still, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest, you see that? Me against him. To destroy him without cause. See where he told him? He told the devil right on the spot. He said, Job still held on to his faith. Even though you used me to try to destroy him. This is and, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man has will he give for his life. So now he wants to go further because he saw that when he took Job's things, it didn't affect Job. Now the devil wants the right to touch Job physically. That the only thing man has worth anything is his own life. 
let me have, let me tempt that. Put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. And he, I'm sorry, Satan says, and he shall curse thee to thy face. Now that the devil fell in, t in affecting Job by removing all his worldly things, now he's saying, affect Job physically, and I bet you he'll curse thee. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown, to his head. Now this chapter will go on, but I want you all to read it. The first chapter is a duplicate of the second chapter. And I want you to see that Job had, by way of the Most High, like it says in like 3, 323, why is light given unto man whose way is hid and whom God has hedged in? You'll find that it was a woman, the wife of Job, that let the devil back in. She'll tell him, I'm not talking about women because it's a woman, it could have been a man. She'll tell Job to turn away from God, curse him and get all your, thing, your belongings back at the end of it. Now what were we talking about? We were talking about this day and time and the messages of Jesus, the Messiah to the world, the day and time you're in, how powerful the devil is and what he's doing. Well, the devil has got the world by a grip right now. Christians can't do nothing about it because they worship him. They call him Zeus. He just added Jesus. That was not the Messiah's name. If you ask a Christian, what was the name of Jesus? They'll say Jesus. And then they'll say that Jesus means the Savior. Right? Therefore, that's not a name. That's a title. If you'll say Christ, you say Christ, Christos, or Messiah, or Messiah, means the anointed. That is also a title, not a name. Emmanuel, meaning God with us, they say, which merely means the strength of the Most High in faith. That is also a title. They don't even know his name. Yet he said, Our Father who art in heaven, holy be thy name. They don't even know the name of the very man that they claim to worship because they refuse to read the books of Moses, which is what Jesus told them to do in St. John when he said the law came from Moses, but grace and truth came from him. I did not come to change but to fulfill, he said, the law of Moses. Not one jot nor one tittle, one letter yet or one dot, nukta, will fall from this scripture until the kingdom of heaven comes. All these things he told them, but they maliciously and willfully become antichrist. Turn against what Jesus taught, like I said earlier, to for what Paul taught, who hated Jesus, and wrote most of the books in what they call the New Testament. The only book in this Bible of what you call the New Testament that is attributed to Jesus, as I said many times, is the book of Revelations. Every other one is a letter or a gospel according to the person whose name is there. And most of them never even understood what Jesus was teaching because he said, there are many things I have to say unto you, however you can't bear them yet. So he told them they were not ready. But these people have gone on and made a religion around an incomplete doctrine and call themselves Christians and refuse to read the Torah that Jesus read from, that Moses read from, so they will know what his name is. I'm using Jesus. Because I want you to ask them what is his real name. And what? They don't know. They'll say his name is Jesus. Because the Bible said him and call him Jesus. Well, when a person gets enrolled in the police department, his name, his name may be Bill. But when he comes to your door, you say, the police are here. You don't say Bill is here. 
Because when he got enrolled in the police department, he became known as a policeman. When Jesus got anointed, he became known as the Messiah. When he set out to save the world, he became known as Jesus. What was his name? <laughs> they don't know. And it's in the book, Was Christ Really Crucified? that I'm putting out. Three volumes. So you go around and ask them, what was his name? Ask them, what is their religion? They'll say Christianity. There's no such religion as Christianity. Because Jesus didn't speak Latin, he didn't speak Greek. He wouldn't even understand the word Christos. Jesus was the Messiah. You read it right in St. John chapter 1, verse 41. You say you believe in that book. It says right in there, when Simon and Andrew first finds his brother, they say we have found the Messiah who's being interpreted to Christ. St. John chapter 1, verse 41. He was the Messiah. So they think they should be calling themselves Messiaen, the Messiahs, not Christians. By Jesus says in Matthew 24, many shall come in my name and say they are Christians. Or say they are Christ and are not. What is the role of the angel of death? The angel of death, who is referred to as Israel in the scripture, was the angel assigned to shape the flesh of Adam in the garden and put him in the garden. Thus, he was also the angel that had been sent to collect the souls of men on Judgment Day. Now, many people who say they died and reached the other side say they, they meet a being there who has light, who has his hand stretched forth trying to tell them to come to the other side and most of them turn around and come back here rather than going on. That being that they meet when you leave this plane, the being that meets you on the next plane is the angel of death. He's not ugly and gross and frightening. He's an angel of light who comes to meet you to take you from this state, Nessus, into the state of Malakut, into the angelic state or the next realm, to prepare you for your own judging. So he does that with everyone? Every being that has a soul. Because there are races of people on earth who have no soul, merely a spirit. When they die, their in-embodied spirits roam the plane. This plane, in what they call exmaplasma or vapor, they become ghosts or whatever you want to call it, they intimidate people. What's the difference between a spirit and a soul? Good question. In the original language, you have the word ruh. Ruh means wind. And that is soul. It has an effect on objects. Wind moves objects. You follow? Mm -hmm. Whereas nefs or nefesh in Hebrew, nefs in Arabic, means spirit. Now, the spirit is the light from the heaven. It is the skin. The soul is the emotional body and it's the light from the earth which you call hala or your aura. You follow that? Every living thing, including rocks, have a spirit. Everything that lives has a spirit. But everything that has emotional changes has a soul. Now there are also those who assimilate emotional changes and they practice it daily in the form of cinema called movies. This is why back in the ancient days when they speak about the stages and Shakespeare stages, all that drama did not come out of Africa, didn't come out of India, didn't come out of the outer world, it came out of Europe. These playwrights in emulating life, in emulating emotions, which may sound like it's not important, but has developed into movies today of people emulating emotions. You follow? And the reason why there's no real good black actors on a scale of white actors is because black people are not good liars. To be a good actor, you have to be a good liar. You follow? Yes. And when you watch the average black actor, you know, you watch Sidney Poitier and you say, he's a good actor. But you really can see through it, you see it as an act. Mm -hmm. You can watch certain white movies and they convince you to the point <laughs> where you can become emotionally about it. You can almost cry. Yes. Well, they are acting like they have emotions. So no white people have? They have forfeit their soul. Now this does not include people all the way down to certain Italians, Jews, certain of these people are the black seed. They better remember it though. 
They don't want to admit that they're black. They have mixed in. They are part of the lost tribe, some of them. Not all of them, some of them. And you don't know who they are, and I'm not going to sit out and pick them out. So they'll let us know when they're ready to come home who they are. But um, in terms of when can the curse of Canaan and um, the Amorites, the thing that I don't understand is, did they lose their soul in that curse? Right. You actually, what you got to understand is that when Ham, when Ham was receiving it, Canaan's son's body was inhibited by certain of the 200 fallen angels. Your father, they became possessed. Okay. And that was, and their soul was pushed from their body. You and follow that? Forth, their children would have no soul? From then forth, their children have the jinn living in them the way you have an angel living in you. And you have to stimulate that angelic being to raise it, and it's called the Holy Spirit when it's in you. Well, in them is the unholy spirit which Jesus said in the Bible when he said, I know the blasphemy of those who call themselves Jews and are not. They are the synagogues of Satan. You see that? Yeah. A synagogue is a name for a temple. If I say that a person is a synagogue of Satan, I'm saying their body is a temple where Satan resides. You see that? So, so Satan is in place of their soul. That's right. Satan and his unholy angels like I explained in Genesis that there'll be a seed for Satan so what about like evil spirits like having more than one inside there are more than one there's legions okay. people that are open can be possessed by many different demons mm -hmm. once you are, are open a medium you open your when you mess with Ouija boards and Torah cards and astrology you open yourself up for any embodied soul but these are not descending souls these are residing souls. The difference is a descending soul comes down from the he heaven plane and a residing soul is in embodied souls, people who have died and will come in and pretend they're scholars, pretend they're mystics, and it's a big joke. And they can get into a person's body and pretend that they're somebody and they're not. They're not spiritual beings at all. A lot of these people call themselves mediums are being possessed by people who've died in that vicinity where they set up their little office months ago or years ago. There's different types of ghosts. They have different effects on the physical plane. Some of them are impressions, meaning the incident upon which they died was so drastic that they stamped themselves in time and at a certain time every year they reoccur. There's others that are so wicked and they died in such a frightening way that they're bound to the physical plane and they become demons, ghouls, as we call them. Not only does white people get possessed, black people get possessed too now. Um, the other question was, in terms of self-realization, and the four questions, who am I, what am I, where am I going, where have I been, what's the next step from that? First one is, what am I? Right. Tell me what you are. I don't, I don't know the answer. Okay, I'll tell you the first one. Okay. And then you go from there and study, and then we'll come back again. Okay. And the Almighty breathed into man of his spirit and man became a soul. A, 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 a living soul because they're dead souls yeah. a living soul right. then, i understand that okay that tells you what you are okay. now what's your next question it was i thought it was what am i isn't it who am i that's another one okay. what are you first right now i i got i came to that because the first one the answer to myself good but who am i so whenever I, whenever I say who am I, and the answer being Marla, that doesn't fit. It doesn't fit because that's not who you are. That's what they named you on the earth plane to bound you. So I haven't found the answer to that. That's right. So should I keep looking? Well, okay. I can tell you or you uh, can keep looking. It's more fun for you to keep looking, though. Okay. Well, but, uh, why don't you tell me and I'll look anyway? Just you're okay. Looking. You're a Jebarian. And what does that mean? See? You're back to another problem. <laughs> it means... A giant in the earth a son of God who came to the earth your father a son of God that came to the earth I'm using that for lack of a better word in the scriptures when it says the sons of God came down to the earth they called them Nephilians in ones the wicked ones and uh, righteous ones they call the Jebarians the 200 angels that fell from grace with Lucifer or Zazila was called Nephilians, giants. 
And they went into woman and they conceived the seed and they set up the land called Nod. Right. Which is where Cain went. went when he got. That's where he got killed by Lamech. And on the other hand, twenty and three elders came down and went into the daughters of Cain. You follow? Right. And they gave birth to what's called as Jabarian. And out of the devil's seed, the queen of Nod was called Anak. And the people who were bred out of them were called Anakins. Throughout the scripture, you'll find them as giants. The Bible has so many stories and it, it dimensions. In my father's house, there are many mansions, but people are only teaching you about one of them. That's enough on that subject for now. Okay. Who was this avatar by the name of Sri Sai Baba? I think that's what his name was. There's several Sai Babas. There's Sharti Sai Baba, mm -hmm. and there's such a Sai Baba. Sharti Sai Baba was a Muslim and a master in India who was trying to bring them away from the Hindi faith. He said he would incarnate again. And another man who calls himself such a Sai Baba professes to be that incarnation. But we have proof that he's not. Because A, he tells them that the man that was before him, Sharti Sai Baba, was indeed a Muslim who lived in a mosque. Correct? And as a Muslim, you know where in the world could you comply with the Hindu faith. Not with its thousands of gods and idols and statues. There's no compromising for that. Any master of the spiritual world knows the invalidity of any statue on earth. Even man, in a physical sense, is almost not important, let alone a statue. So, such a Sai Baba is a self-acclaimed avatar where Shorty Sai Baba was a real Ila Mutajasida. Is what the real word of it is. Okay? The man that you see in India walking around in an orange jalabia, that's not nobody but an impersonator. And if you read enough history, you'll find there's about 50 of them in India saying the same thing. Saying that they produce vabuti, as they call it, and saying that they materialize things. There's whole lots of them there. And that's because the people of the Hindu faith belong to the religion of Satan. They have power to do things. Don't underestimate the power of Satan. Don't think every time somebody levitates or makes something materialize, you got to be righteous, because that's not true. Satan himself was an angel who fell from grace. How in the world is the difference between an extraterrestrial being and a celestial being? An extraterrestrial being means a being who has come into this atmosphere and he's extra. He's not one calculated in the book of life according to the Earth's sphere called Nasut. If he comes out of Malakut into Nasut, he is an extra being in this terrestrial environment. You understand? Yeah. I remember reading that um, an avatar, um, and I, an avatar can come in, in avatars come in succession. Like one right. spirit incarnates into a person who then incarnates into another person. Correct. And I was wondering, okay, being that, um, okay, the Holy Ghost, whoever resided in him, must have been there all the time if they enter you from the time of birth. That's, a, and that's pertaining to the angel Gabriel who came to Mary, right? Uh-huh. Okay, go ahead. But now remember that Jesus had to be made after the order of Melchizedek. You understand that? Uh -huh. That's his next step higher than the angel Gabriel. Oh. Go ahead. I think I, I think I see where you're trying to go. Yeah. So go ahead. Okay. I was, so it said, um, when a person is born, that the avatar incarnates into him as the person grows and matures. That's one way he becomes illumutigested. There's different ways. Oh. He can become illumutigested because the the spirit enters into the spark when, when I, I explain when a man before a man in jack has a spark travels up a spinal column to go to the brain to get the charge. Uh -huh. he, they can do it at that point. They can come into a person when they're dying. At the moment a person gets into a car accident and the car crashes and they're about to die, another spirit can take that body and that person will survive and be a different being. Many different ways that spirits get into the body. But it's how, it's a certain resistant state that the human body has to be at to make themselves vulnerable to possession. 
And then when the spirit incarnates into that person, then that person becomes an avatar? It depends. If that avatar is a teacher or just an unembodied spirit. If the spirit that comes into them is from a realm where he's a teacher, then that person will go about teaching. If it's just an unembodied spirit, anything could happen from possession to demonic possession to sicknesses, anything. The world you're talking about is much more sensitive than just the one thing that avatars some angelic being who comes down and takes the body and boom, a person becomes a teacher. More to it than that. So then what do they mean by avatars come in succession? Who's they? I mean, not they. What does it mean when it's... When well, in because the word avatar is not as important as people like to make it. See, the word avatar, or like I said, ila mutajasida, is no more than the awakening of the supreme being in an individual. He realizes that he is one with the creator at that time. You follow that? Mm -hmm. That's nowhere near as important as Mikhail or Michael or Gabriel incarnating a conscious spirit who have been teaching for centuries, as you know them, mm -hmm. which is a much higher position. Uh, a person can be a man, become an avatar, develop into an angelic being by being stirred or tutored by an angelic being. But if he has an avatar in him, if he has a spirit, a divine spirit in him, then it's easier for him to be taught by angelic beings than he would if he didn't have it. He becomes a more accessible medium than if he's just a person who gets premonitions. So Whereas Jesus was a person who didn't get premonitions, the Spirit was in him. So for him to send divine powers from the Father through him was quite simple. Whereas other people who would get flashes of divinity, Muhammad for instance, would receive these spiritual impressions. Go away him. You see? Oh, uh, yeah. This is a short course to remind you that these are old classics with Dr. Malachi Z. York, then known as Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi, teaching one of the schools on our way up onto Nuwapu. Um, I have a small question. Is it possible for more than one avatar to enter into the same being? Yes, when I speak to people over a period of years, as you all know, different voices come from me.